Hi, Mark. I'm Donna. My student number is S O four four one O five two. Today, I'm going to read a speech delivered by Karen Des, and the title is "How to Stop Torture." I'm freshman in N C U E. In nineteen ninety four, I walked into a prison in Cambodia, and I met a twelve year old boy who had been tortured and was denied access to counsel. And as I looked into his eyes, I realized that, for the hundreds of letters I had written for political prisoners, that I would never have written a letter for him, because he was not a twelve-year-old boy who had done something important for anybody. He was not a political prisoner. He was a twelve-year-old boy who had stolen a bicycle. What I also realized at the point. Was that it was not only in Cambodia, but of the hundred and thirteen developing countries, developing countries led torture. Ninety-three of these countries have all passed law that say you have a right to lawyer and you have a right not to be tortured. And what I recognized was that there was an incredible window window of opportunity. For us as a world community to come together and end torture as an investigative tool, we often think of torture as being political torture or reserved for just the wars. But in fact, 95% of torture today is not for political prisoners. It is for people who are in broken down legal systems, and unfortunately. Because torture is the cheapest form of investigation, it's cheaper than having a legal system, cheaper than having a lawyer and early access to counsel. It is what happens most of the time. Most of the time, I believe today that is, that is, that it is possible for us as a world community. If we make a decision to come together and end torture as an investigative tool in our lifetime, but it will require three things. First is the training, empowerment, and connection of defenders worldwide. The second is ensuring that there is systematic early access to counsel, and the third is commitment. So in the year two thousand. I began to wonder, what if we came together? Could we do something for these ninety-three countries? And I founded International Bridge to Justice, which has a specific mission of ending torture as an investigative tool and impl- implementing due process rights in the ninety-three countries by placing trained lawyers at an early stage in police station. Police stations and in count rooms. My first experiences, though, they come from Cambodia, and at the time, I remember first coming to Cambodia, and there were in 1994 still less than 10 attorneys in the country because the Khmer Rouge had killed them all. And even 20 years later. There was only ten lawyers in the country, so consequently, you'd walk into a prison, and not only would you meet twelve-year-old boys, you'd meet women, women, and you'd say, "Why are you here?" Women would say, "Well, I've been here for ten years because my husband committed a crime, but they can't find him, so it's just a place where there was no rule of law." The first group of defenders. Came together and I still remember. As I was training, I said, "Okay, what do you do for an investigation?" And there was silence in the class. And finally, one woman stood up in audible name, and she, she said, "Crew, which Miss Teacher?" She said, "I have defended more than a hundred people, and I have never had to do any investigation." Because they all come with confessions, and we talk about as a class the fact that number one, the confessions might not be reliable, but number two, we did not want to encourage the police to keep doing this. 
especially as it was now against the law. And it took a lot of courage for these defenders to decide that they would begin to stand up and support each other in implementing these laws. And I still remember the first cases where they came, all 25 together. She would stand up, and they were in the back, and they would support her. And the judge kept saying, "No, no, no, no! We are going to do things the exact same way we have been doing them." But one day, the perfect case came, and it was a woman who was a vegetable seller. She was sitting outside of a house. She said that she actually saw the person run out, who she thinks stole whatever the jewelry was. But the police come, they got her. There was nothing on her. She was pregnant at the time. She had cigarette burns on her. She had miscarried. And when they brought her case to the judge, for the first time he stood up and he said, "Yes, there's no evidence except for your torture confession, and you will be released." And the defenders began to take cases over and over again, and you will see. They have step by step began to change the course of history in Cambodia, but Cambodia is not alone. I used to think, well, is it Cambodia, or is it other countries? But it is in so many countries. In Burundi, I walked into a prison, and it wasn't a twelve-year-old boy. It was an eight-year-old boy for stealing a mobile phone. Or a woman, I pick up her baby. Really cute baby. I said, "Your baby is so cute." It wasn't a baby; she was three, and she said, "Yeah, but she's why I'm here, because she was accused of stealing two diapers and an iron for her baby, and still had been in prison." And when I walk up to the prison director, I said, "You have got to let her out. A judge would let her out." And he said, "Okay, we can talk about it," but. Look at my prison. Eighty percent of the two thousand people here are without a lawyer. What can we do? So lawyers began to courageously stand up together to organize a system where they can take case, cases. But we realized that it's not only the training of the lawyers, but the connection of the lawyers that makes a difference. For example, in Cambodia, it was less. Inaudible name did not go alone, but she had twenty-four warriors with her who stood out together. And in the same way, in China, they always tell me it's like a fresh wine in the desert when we can come together. Or in Zimbabwe, where I remember innocent after coming out of a prison well. Everybody stood up and said, "I have been here for one year, eight years, twelve years without a lawyer." He came and we had a training together, and he said, "I have heard this day." Because he had heard people mumbling and grumbling, I have heard this said that we cannot help to create justice because we do not have the resource. And then he said. But I want you to know that the lack of resources is never an excuse for injustice. And with that, he successfully organized sixty-eight lawyers who have been systematically taking the cases. The key that we see, though, is training and an early assess. I was recently in Egypt and was inspired to meet with another group of lawyers. And what they told me is that they said. Hey, look! We don't have police on the street now. The police are one of the main reasons reasons why we had a revolution. Revolution. They were torturing everybody all the time, and I said, but there's been tens of millions of dollars that have recently gone into the development of the legal system here. What's going on? I met with one of the development agents, and they were training prosecutors and judges, which is the normal bias, as opposed as opposed to defenders. And they showed me a manual which actually was an excellent manual. 
I said, I'm gonna copy this. It had everything in it. Lawyers can come at the police station. It was perfect. Prosecutor, prosecutors were perfectly trained. But I said to them, I just have one question, which is, by the time that everybody got to the prosecutor's office, what had happened to them? And after pause, they said they had been tortured. So the pieces are not only the training of the lawyers, but as finding a way to systematically implement early access to counsel. Because they are the safeguard in the system for people who are being tortured. And as I tell you this, I'm also aware of the fact that it sounds like, oh, okay, it sounds like we could do it. But can we really do it? Because it sounds big, and there are many reasons why I believe it's possible. The first reason is the people on the ground who find ways of creating miracles because of their commitment. It's not only innocent, who I told you about in Zimbabwe, but defenders all over the world who are looking for these pieces. We have a program called Justice Markers, and we realize there are people that are courageous and want to do things. But how can we support them? So it's an online contest where it's only $5,000. If you come up with an innovative way of implementing injustice, implementing justice, and there are 30 justice makers throughout the world, from Sri Lanka to Switzerland to the DRC, who with $5,000 to do amazing things through SMS programs, through paralegal programs, through whatever they can do. It's not only these justice makers, but people will courageously see figure out who their networks are and how they can move it forward. So in China, for instance, great laws came out where it says police cannot torture people or they will be punished. And I was sitting side by side with one of our very courageous lawyers and said, how can we get this out? How can we make sure that this is implemented? That this is fantastic. And he said to me, well, do you have money? And I said, no. And he said, that's okay. We can still figure it out. And on December 4th, he organized 3,000 members of the youth communist league from 14 of the top law schools who organized themselves, developed poster with the new laws, and went to the police station and began what he says is a non-violent legal revolution to protect citizen rights. So I talk about the fact that we need to train and support defenders. We need to systematically implement early access to counsel. But the third and most important thing is that we make a commitment to this. And people often say to me, you know, this is great, but it's wildly idealistic. Never going to happen. And the reason that I think that those words are interesting is because those were the same kinds of words that were used for people who decide they would end slavery or end apartheid. It began with a small group of people who decide they would commit. Now, there's one of our favorite poems from the defenders, which they share from each other. It's take courage, friends. The road is often long. The path is never clear. And the stakes are very high. But deep down, you are not alone. And I believe that if we can come together as a world community to support not only defenders, but also everyone in the system who is looking towards it, we can end torture as an investigative tool. I end always because I'm sure the questions are, and I'd be happy to talk to you at any point, but what can I really do? 
Well, I was jealous. First of all, you know what you can do. But second of all, I would have you with the story of Vishnu, who actually was my inspiration for starting International Bridge to Justice. Vishnu was a four-year-old boy when I met him, who was born in a Cambodian prison in Kando Province. But because he was born in the prison, everybody loved him, including the guards. So he was the only one who was allowed to come in and out of the bars. So you know, there's bars. And by the time that Vishnu was getting bigger, which means what gets bigger, your head get. Bigger, so he would come to the first bar, the second bar, and the third bar, and then really slowly move his head, so he could fit through, and come back third, second, first, and he would grab my pinko because what he wanted to do every day is he wanted to go visit. You know, he never quite made it to all of them every day, but he wanted to visit all. One hundred and fifty-six prisoners, and I would leave him, and he would put his fingers through. Oh, if they were dark cells, he was like Aram Corregat, and he would put his fingers through. And most of the prisoners said that he was their greatest joy and their sunshine, and they looked forward to him. And I was like, here's Vishnu. Here's a four-year-old boy. He was born. He was born in a prison with almost nothing, no material goods, but he had a sense of his own heroic journey, which I believe we are all born into. He said, "Probably I can't do everything, but I'm one. I can do something, and I will do the one thing that I can do." So I thank you for having the prophetic imagination. To image the shaping of a new world with us together, and invite you into this journey with us. Thank you. Applause. Thank you. Applause. Thank you. Applause.